Hello, students, and hello, YouTube. Uh, I'm trying a few little different things here today, so uh, bear with me. Maybe a little different hairdo. See? Uh, what I want to do today is I want to talk briefly. Now, this is one of those days that I could go along on, but I intend to maintain my time frame because I've got my kiln cooking and it's going to cook on a certain time and I want to make sure that I'm done and ready to go. So uh, what we're going to do today is talk about time. And uh, we're going to start off with the, the idea of a calendar and how do you know when it is? Um, so the year that I recorded, I'm recording this is 2020, the craziest year uh, lately anyway. And the reason that we say that this is the calendar year 2020 is that we are using the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar is a calendar instituted by Pope Gregory. And the calendar begins with the year zero as the year of Jesus's birth. So when we say it is 2020, that means it's been 2020 years ish since the birth of Jesus. And that was instituted by Pope Gregory back in 1582. So what was the time, what was the calendar before 1582? Uh, before then, Rome and all of uh, Europe used the Julian calendar. So the Julian calendar marks its year zero with the founding of Rome. So, uh, so the founding of Rome marks the year zero. The Pope, a thousand years, well, 1,500 years later, says, eh, why are we going to make our calendar the year that Rome was founded? Uh, let's make our calendar the year that Jesus was born. So it was changed. So your, uh, uh, the year uh, uh, zero was marked by the birth of Jesus. So um, there's a little fluctuation in terms of those years and et cetera that we don't really need to go into, but uh, just know that time, the time that you are living in is a subjective thing. Uh, time doesn't have a number to it. We just put it on there. Not all calendars recognize this year as the year 2020. So the Islamic calendar, for example, begins its year with the, uh, or its calendar, sorry, with the flight of Muhammad from the city of Medina to the city of Mecca. So, and that happened in the calendar, the Gregorian calendar year, 1439. No, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it happened in the year 700, uh, where is it? Uh, now I'm confused. Um, uh, oops, uh, shoot. Uh, the flight, so that was the year about the seven, uh, the, Gre the Gregorian year, shoot, wouldn't you know I'd forget that? Uh, but I'm in a hurry, so I'm going to move on. So uh, that was, the, so that was 1,000, never mind. <laughs> so the Islamic world does not recognize the Gregorian calendar as the calendar of reference. Uh, you know, uh, is Islamic people and Muslim countries understand the Gregorian calendar and do business with and, you know, buy computers from, you know, people uh, who use the Gregorian calendar. So they understand what it is, but they just don't recognize that same calendar. Uh, the Chinese calendar is also different. You know, uh, the Chinese civilization has been around for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, so they're, they have a relatively continuous civilization uh, for much longer than the European continent has had its continuous civilization. So the Chinese calendar is, again, different. So the point is, is that time is really a construct that we impose upon it. Uh, so in this class, I will very rarely... And I'm not going to say a never, but very rarely will I ever ask you to know a date. Occasionally, like especially when we're talking about the French Revolution, the American Revolution, I kind of get on dates a little bit there just because dates are kind of important. Uh, but rarely do I get uh, involved in dates for this class because what I do 
as I talk about epochs. Yeah. By the way, don't forget, get your notebook situated. Right side is for the information that I give you. Left side is for your thinking. Feel free to pause this right now and do a little thinking about the uh, time and the calendar. And, oh, yeah, I didn't really realize that other cultures didn't really see it as the year 2020. So, yeah, pause and think. Uh, so a cultural epoch. A cultural epoch or an epoch is known uh, is is delineated by something by a, a, a paradigm, uh, something that you know to be true. So uh, you know, just as an example, uh, you know, we'll use 2020 as a reference, which is a crazy year, and um, uh, our outlook, our mental framework, will probably be somewhat shifted by a global pandemic. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's the end of an epoch or the beginning of a new epoch. But uh, uh, time has certain cultural markers that we uh, recognize. So, you know, you may have heard in other classes the Industrial Revolution or the Enlightenment or the, uh, you know, the Bronze Age or the Stone Age. You know, those are epochs, meaning it is a boundary of time where civilization sort of follows the same mindset. So, uh, you know, let's just say hypothetically, it is 2020 after all, that uh, that this month uh, we encounter alien civilizations for the first time. We discover that there's life on other planets. That would be at the end of an, I mean, that would begin a new epoch, a new, a new era of thinking for humankind. Uh, when we set new boundaries on what we recognize to be true, that is when a new epoch is born. So uh, we are going to, in this class, use epochs, and I'll talk about epochs, not really specific dates, uh, although lots of times I will give you dates to kind of put a boundary on this, on an epoch. So that's my plan. Uh, and, and, by, and these are not fixed. So, you know, my class might be a little different than history or, you know, science or each, you know, cultures are sort of recognized in different sort of chunks. So there you go. Um, so here are some nice words for you that you can put in your notes. Just copy them down. Feel free to pause. So uh, the, the English language doesn't have a real good word for an epoch. Uh, the Germans do. They have a lovely word called Zeitgeist. Uh, and Zeit and Geist. So Geist is ghost and Zeit is time. So it's literally the spirit of the times. So, uh, you know, and that's a lovely word to describe a cultural epoch. The, 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 the overarching spirit that guides the people that exist in this particular time, the zeitgeist. What a nice word. Thanks, Germany. Uh, another word, it is also German, uh, is gestalt. So gestalt is a word that uh, means when you see the big picture or when, you put, when you're not uh, focused in on one little tiny bit, you're, you're kind of observing the whole of it at one time at one instance, at one glance. So, uh, so these are, so the gestalt is the sum total of experiences that create the time, this, the, or, you know, or whatever you, you're talking about when you say gestalt. Uh, the English language, we have a pretty good word for this, not the best, uh, but it's paradigm. And paradigm means a similar thing as zeitgeist and gestalt, but a little different. Uh, the paradigm is sort of the, the mental construct that you use to make your decisions. It's the lens through which you focus. So, you know, uh, living through a global pandemic will change your paradigm, whether you believe it's a hoax or not. Uh, either way, your paradigm, the set of information that you use to build the rules that you live by, <clears throat> d 
those are, uh, that's your paradigm. So three good words to sort of describe what I mean when I say an epoch. An epoch is a period of time that is described by a set of assumptions and ideas, a set of thoughts, a, a, a body of information, a lens, a, a, a framework that you view the world. So there you go, an epoch. If we were in person and I wasn't doing this video, uh, I would go into a little more detail on that. Um, but, you know, feel free to Google it up. Any of these words are good. Look up epoch. And, you know, these are great words to help you wrap your head around what an epoch is. So in art, and, all, and I'm talking about the visual and performing arts specifically, there is a swing and a rebellion of periods and styles. And generally, not always, but generally these periods and styles reflect the culture and the epoch. So, and that's not a rule, but it's kind of a nice framework to wrap your brain around. So if you think about a pendulum and a pendulum swings back and forth. And so what art does, whether it's music or dance or literature or visual art, sculpture, architecture, uh, there is an ebb and flow and a swing and a rebellion and a reaction against and to uh, new thoughts and new ideas. That's what art is all about is new ideas. So the paradigm of art often changes and especially rebels against the period that came before it. So generally we use the words tranquility and chaos to describe the, that change. Although some artsy people will say periods of tranquility, uh, and period, I'm sorry, periods of, uh, uh, romance and a period of classicism. So all of those terms are handy dandy. Uh, tranquility and chaos is kind of my preference. So uh, when we talk about the styles of artwork, uh, each artwork rebels against what came before it. So if we go back to, and again, I'm talking about European history right now. Um, and I, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I will do my best to in, be as multicultural as I can um, and reflect other cultures that don't necessarily fit into the, the epochs that I've described. Uh, but, you know, I'm primarily focusing on European and American history since this is, after all, America. America! Uh, so, uh, when you think about periods and this, you know, when we're swinging all, we're going to go all the way back to Greece and Rome. Greece and Rome uh, is, is, you know, the definition of classical style. So it doesn't mean that there wasn't chaos during that time period. It doesn't mean that everything was boring and calm. It just means that the, 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 the zeitgeist, the, the paradigm of the people was towards objective, rational, uh, primarily secular thoughts and ideas. And then when you swing away from the Greek and the Roman, you swing into the uh, medieval period. And the medieval period is marked generally by a more emotional, uh, restless, subjective, sacred time. So you get a swing from one to the other, from a, a period of tranquility or classical, classical to a period of chaos or more romantic. From the medieval, you swing back to the Renaissance, which is the rebirth of the classical ideas of the Greeks and Romans. And from the Rena uh, Renaissance, you swing into the Baroque, which is the ornate decorative style uh, that is very sacred and ornamental. And then you swing over back again to the neoclassical style. And I'll, when we get to, you know, hit that, we'll start talking about American history, which is interesting, I think. Uh, and then from the classical, you turn into the romantic and the romantic comes back to realism and realism comes back to the rest. So there is a rebellion and a reaction against the previous period. And many times these artistic styles reflect the cultural epochs. So for example, you know, neoclassicism, neoclassicism reflects the Enlightenment, for example. So, uh, you know, the medieval reflects the fall of Rome. So all of this stuff fits into 
a historical context and the zeitgeist of the people. So the best way that I can describe this is to talk about pants. Did he say pants? Yeah, pants. So let's talk about pants. Oh, my daggone uh, uh, presentation didn't work like I wanted it to. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I wonder if I can end it real quick. Can I end this presentation? I want to get rid of that picture. Shoot. I need you to go there, mister. I thought I got rid of that. Um, exit. And then I need to get rid of this dude. I thought I got rid of him already. And so we can see the, uh, I bet I didn't save it. I bet that's what it was. So bam. So um, if here is our pants, um, pants are very easy to understand. Uh, you wear pants and you go and buy them at the store. So if you think, so, you know, in the 1950s, uh, the pants that people wore were very slim fitted pants cuffed at the bottom uh, and, you know, tapered in the leg. Pants. And the 50s swings into the 60s. And the 60s is marked by, you know, much more of a restless period swinging. Uh, and the pants go from very slim, fitted, tight jeans to big bell bottom or flared pants. So there's a rebellion and a reaction against the period that came before it. So you got the 60s and the 70s. And then from the 60s and 70s, you swing back to when I was a teenager and I was buying pants. And uh, when I was in high school in the 80s, girls would use pliers to zip up their pants. And guys, I would fold my pants at the bottom to make them as tight around my leg as I possibly could. Why? Because I was reacting against the previous styles and thoughts, the, the 70s and the 60s. So you get the 80s, uh, you get your tight pants again, and then you swing into the 90s and the 2000s. And I can remember, good Lord, the 90s and 2000s, kids in school wore the biggest pants you ever saw. They were gymungous pants, and they would come in, and the bottom of the pants would be all beat up and frayed from where they walked around, and they'd be all wet from walking to school and walking from the bus. And the, they'd be a hot mess. They'd be big, giant pants uh, all flared out and stuff. So you get the 90s and the early 2000s and then into the 2010s and into now to 2020, uh, you get skinny pants again are back in style. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, I got bad news for you is uh, pants are going to go back. So the pants that you currently are wearing soon will drop out of style and you'll have to buy new pants. Uh, because the styles will again react against the skinny, tight fitting, form fitting, uh, whatever you call them, skinny jeans. Is that what they're called? I don't know. So yeah, well, yeah. And, and like girls, for example, currently in 2020, their pants are so tight that they're like, you know, their yoga pants, leggings, is that what they're called? That's how tight the pants are. They're like hosiery. They're like, uh, they're, 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 they're stuck to the skin. That's how tight they are. So soon kids will look at their moms and say, what ifs? I'm totally not wearing what my mom wears. Just do kids say what ifs anymore? Uh, and they will rebel against these skinny little yoga pants and they will start wearing big old giant pants again. You see how that works? It's a swing. It's a reaction against the periods and styles that come before pants. Sure. So, uh, whippersnaps, uh, I think that's all I got. Uh, yep. We're going to wrap this thing up. I, hopefully I didn't go over 20 minutes. Uh, and I don't know, I can't, I'm not keeping time. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so we're getting ready to wrap up this. We're wrapping up the sort of general introduction stuff to this class. And now you have an idea of, um, of kind of how we're structuring it and how it's going to work and how we're going to talk about this stuff. Uh, and if you don't, you know, uh, feel free to uh, pause and rewind. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you all have a good day. Stay healthy, wear a mask, wear your tight little skinny pants. And uh, that's where this, so if I, if I put my guys back in here, where was the, so the two people that I removed, 
So let me see if I can put these back in there, bam. And so these are some skinny pants wearing girls. And with the ripped jeans, see ripped jeans? We invented that back in the 80s. I remember John Cougar Mellencamp sitting there, the walls come tumbling down. That was the first use of the ripped pants, as far as I know. And, you know, I was there, so why wouldn't I know that, right? Uh, so, yeah, you got the, yeah, these, uh, these girls wearing their skinny pants. And this dude right here, this from 2017, uh, that dude, he's look, he looks like the 50s. I mean, that's like, the, if, yeah, people could have worn that in the 50s. So, sure. Okay, I'm really stopping now. I get excited. I could really go on about this for a while. It's interesting. 